If you could travel a billion years into the future, what would our precious planet Earth look like? Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're setting off on an incredible temporal epic, a journey where every second catapults you thousands of years ahead. Beyond the familiar constellations, beyond the cosmic infinity, you see a glimmer, a point of azure and emerald. It's our Earth. But is it the same as the one we know today? Has it kept its oceans, its mountains, its lush forests? Or has it changed beyond recognition, shaped by time? Answers we'll find on this odyssey. But before you set off on your next adventure, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you, and have a great trip! Astrophysicists were the first to address the question of the long-term viability of the biosphere. Earlier studies into the possibility of Earth's future habitability focused mainly on the interaction between solar heating during its transformation into a red giant, the carbonate, silicate, geochemical cycle, and water loss. New studies have enabled scientists to predict Earth's future habitability, based on detailed models. These models take into account the Sun's influence on geochemical cycles, such as those for carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. In addition, the researchers have included the methane cycle, which encompasses the metabolism of living organisms as well as the redox exchange between crust and mantle. These elements make it possible to track the processes that control oxygen levels in the atmosphere on a geological scale. This makes it possible to predict the planet's evolution billions of years into the future. The scientists adopted a stochastic approach randomly selecting parameters for the model, including variations in the rate of outgassing from the Earth's mantle and the acceleration of erosion. They established initial conditions for the Earth 600 million years ago, then ran the model around 400,000 times covering the planet's evolution to the present day. Of all the tests carried out, only around 5,000 reproduce conditions similar to those of the modern Earth. These results were then used to predict the future evolution of our planet. Despite some uncertainty, none of the scenarios predicted an oxygen-enriched atmosphere for more than 1.5 billion years. This hypothesis could only be realized in the obviously impossible scenario in which the Sun does not increase its luminosity. As in the past, the Earth continues to be a system in constant evolution. The planet has gone through a series of warming and cooling periods. Ice ages will return, as will periods of extreme warming. Tectonic processes will continue to move continents close and open oceans. The fall of a giant asteroid or the eruption of a supervolcano will once again deal a severe blow to life on Earth. Many details of Earth's history are largely unknown, if not completely unknowable. But the study of the past and the laws of nature give us an idea of the global evolutionary scenario of our planet. Many scientists support the hypothesis that the long-term future of the biosphere is a kind of mirror image of history. The different types of biosphere, 
will disappear in the reverse order of their appearance. Climate change is happening all over the world. From the shores of Chesapeake Bay, the tides report a steady rise in tidal levels compared with previous decades. Year after year, the Sahara expands further north, transforming Morocco's once fertile farmland into a dusty desert. Antarctic ice is rapidly melting and breaking up. Average air and water temperatures are rising steadily. All this reflects a process of gradual global warming, a process that the Earth has experienced countless times in the past and will continue to experience in the future, but which is now largely amplified by human activity over a relatively short period of geological time. Warming can be accompanied by other, sometimes paradoxical, effects. The Gulf Stream, a powerful ocean current that transports warm water from the equator to the North Atlantic, is driven by large temperature differences between the equator and high latitudes. If, as a result of global warming, the temperature contrast decreases, as some climate models suggest, then the Gulf Stream could weaken or stop altogether. Ironically, the immediate result of this change will be to transform the temperate climate of the British Isles in northern Europe, now warmed by the Gulf Stream, into a much cooler one. Similar changes will occur with ocean currents, for example, with a current coming from the Indian Ocean in the South Atlantic beyond the Horn of Africa, which could cause a cooling of South Africa's mild climate, or a change in the monsoon climate that provides part of Asia with fertile rainfall. When glaciers melt, sea levels rise. According to the most conservative estimates, it will rise by half a meter over the next century. The melting of polar ice in the north will reduce the range of animals living in these regions, such as polar bears, which is highly unfavorable for the conservation of the population, whose numbers are already declining. The rapid shift of climatic zones towards the poles will adversely affect other species, particularly birds, which are particularly sensitive to changes in seasonal migration and feeding areas. Whatever other effects of global warming may be revealed over the coming century, we appear to be entering a period of accelerated extinction. Given the Earth's history, such events are commonplace and therefore inevitable on a planetary scale. Between very slow and rapid changes, there are geological processes that usually take centuries or even millennia, including changes in climate, sea levels, and ecosystems that can go unnoticed for generations. The main threat is not the changes themselves, but their degree. For the state of the climate, sea level or the very existence of ecosystems can reach a critical level. The acceleration of positive feedback processes can strike our world in unexpected ways. What usually takes several millennia can happen the space of a few decades. To better understand the consequences of a rapid and abrupt rise in climate, let's go back in time to 56 million years ago to discover the most significant global warming on Earth to date. This period considerably affected the evolution and distribution of mammals, causing extinctions, changes in flora, and huge migrations of fauna. To give you an idea, the globe was slightly different during the Eocene, the Isthmus of Panama did not yet connect 
South and North America, allowing ocean circulation between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. This circulation meant that Antarctica was not as thermally isolated as it is today. The Drake Passage was not open at the time. Antarctica was therefore connected to South America at the time. This arrangement of continental masses, combined with high CO2 levels, explains why there were no ice caps on Earth. During this period, palm trees grew in Antarctica, where temperatures ranged between 10 and 25 degrees Celsius, 50 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Fossils of alligators of the extinct genus, Alleganthosuchus, have also been found in the Arctic. In the oceans, surface waters reached almost 36 degrees Celsius or 97 degrees Fahrenheit in places. Pelinological studies show the existence, 55 to 50 million years ago, of mangrove forests around the Arctic Ocean, on the islands of New Siberia and in the Mackenzie Delta in Canada. The thermal maximum of the Paleocene-Eocene transition lasted around 20,000 years within a 6 million year period of gradual warming. The study of the thermal maximum is important for our times as it is the most famous and well-documented temperature change in Earth's history. It is estimated that at this time the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere may have reached values well in excess of 1,000 parts per million, or ppm. This is much higher than the current concentration of around 415 ppm. Probably triggered by intense volcanic activity, a relatively rapid increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane two inseparable greenhouse gases. This episode resulted in a warming of 5 to 8 degrees Celsius or an increase of between 9 and 15 degrees Fahrenheit over a period of 10,000 to 20,000 years. During these events, between 1,500 and 5,000 gigatons of carbon were released into the ocean atmosphere system over a thousand years. This equates to between one in five billion tons of CO2 released into the atmosphere every year for 1,000 years. To give you an order of magnitude, 40 billion tons of CO2 were released by human activity in 2022. It's important to note that terrestrial ecosystems and oceans absorb around half of man-made CO2 emissions every year. This process is known as a carbon sink. Thus, around 50% of the CO2 emitted by human activity remains in the atmosphere, while the other half is absorbed by the oceans and terrestrial biomass. A 2016 study, based on isotopic analyses of carbon trapped in sedimentary carbonates from this period, suggests that it took around 4,000 years to purge this excess carbon. But at the current rate of emissions, how long will it take the Earth to reduce our carbon surplus? Undoubtedly, this will be a problem for the future of humanity but it will have very little impact on the future evolution of the Earth. In the worst case scenario, it won't be the end of the world, it will be the end of our world. The climatic cooling that began in the Cenozoic caused by the absorption of atmospheric nitrogen by soil bacteria will continue. Consequently, it is difficult to expect significant global warming in the next 100 to 200 million years. Climate warming, which began after the Ice Age 10,000 years ago, is most likely temporary, 
and associated with fluctuations in the Sun's magnetic activity and a slight orbital shift that brought the Earth closer to the Sun during the boreal summer. Paleo temperature measurements taken from planktonic Foraminiferal remains in the Sargasso Sea over the last 3,000 years confirm that the current local increase in average temperatures is taking place against a background of general climate cooling. Interestingly, around 100 million years ago, the Earth had no ice caps and average temperatures were around 17 degrees Celsius or 63 degrees Fahrenheit whereas they have now dropped to 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. This slight drop in temperature led to the start of a new ice age in the middle of the Cenozoic with the formation of ice on Antarctica, followed by periodic glaciations on the continents of North America, Europe, and Asia during the Quaternary. According to expert hypotheses concerning the gradual elimination of nitrogen from the Earth's atmosphere and its burial in the Earth's crust, as well as the organic nitrogen content of precipitation, a slow cooling of the climate should continue in the future, despite an increase in solar activity. This gradual cooling will eventually lead to a new equilibrium state with a cooler climate. However, this new climate level, influenced by the metabolism of nitrogen decomposing microorganisms, may not be very conducive to the prosperity of complex life forms on Earth. So, when the new ice age occurs in the Northern Hemisphere, it could be particularly severe. For the foreseeable future, the most important factor determining the appearance of the Earth's continents is ice. For hundreds of thousands of years, the depth of the oceans was strongly dependent on the total volume of frozen water on Earth, including mountain ice caps, glaciers, and continental ice sheets. The equation is simple. The greater the volume of frozen water on Earth, the lower the water level in the ocean. The past is the key to predicting the future, but how do we know how deep the ancient oceans were? Satellite observations of sea level, while incredibly accurate, have been limited to the last two decades. Gauge measurements of sea level, although less accurate and subject to local variations, have been collected over the last century and a half. Coastal geologists use location feature mapping to study coastal areas. For example, they examine ancient coastlines, such as elevated coastal terraces, which can be identified by coastal marine sedimentary deposits dating back tens of thousands of years. These elevated areas may indicate past periods of rising sea levels, the relative position of fossil corals, which typically grow on the shallow, sun-warmed ocean platform, could extend our history of past events. But this record will be altered as these geological formations rise, sink, and tilt sporadically. A less obvious indicator of sea level has attracted the attention of many experts. Changes in oxygen isotope ratios in the small shells of marine mollusks. Thanks to their ability to respond to changes in temperature, oxygen isotopes provide the key to deciphering the volume of land ice cover in the past and consequently changes in water level in the ancient ocean. But the relationship between ice quantity and oxygen isotopes is tricky. The most abundant isotope of oxygen 
accounting for 99.8% of the oxygen in the air we breathe, is thought to be light oxygen 16, with 8 protons and 8 neutrons. One oxygen atom in 500 is heavy oxygen 18, 8 protons and 10 neutrons. This means that one in every 500 water molecules in the ocean is heavier than normal. When the ocean is heated by the sun's rays, water containing the lighter isotopes of oxygen-16 evaporates faster than oxygen-18. So the weight of water in low-latitude clouds is lighter than in the ocean itself. As clouds inevitably move poleward, the oxygen in their constituent water molecules becomes much lighter than in seawater. When precipitation falls on polar glaciers and ice sheets, the lighter isotopes solidify in the ice, and seawater becomes even heavier. During periods of intense global cooling, when more than 5% of the Earth's water turns to ice, seawater becomes particularly saturated with 18 heavy oxygen. During periods of global warming and glacier retreat, the level of oxygen-18 in seawater decreases. Thus, careful measurements of oxygen isotope ratios in coastal sediments can provide retrospective insight into changes in surface ice volume. This is exactly what a team of geologists at Rutgers University has been doing for decades, studying the thick layers of marine sediments that cover the New Jersey coast. These deposits, which bear witness to the geological history of the last 100,000 years, are saturated with the shells of microscopic fossil organisms called foraminifera. Each tiny foraminifer stores oxygen isotopes in its composition in the same proportion as the oxygen did when the organism grew up. Layer-by-layer -layer measurement of oxygen isotopes in New Jersey coastal sediments provides a simple and accurate means of estimating the amount of ice over a given period. In the recent geological past, ice cover has alternated between shrinkage and expansion, accompanied by large fluctuations corresponding to sea level every few thousand years. At the height of the ice ages, more than 5% of our planet's water volume turned to ice, lowering sea levels by around 100 meters compared to today. It is thought that around 20,000 years ago, during one of these low water periods, a land isthmus formed across the Bering Strait between Asia and North America. It was along this bridge to the New World that humans and other mammals migrated. At the same time, the English Channel did not exist, and a dry valley stretched between the British Isles and France. During periods of warming, when glaciers virtually disappeared and snow caps thinned on mountain peaks, sea levels rose to around 100 meters or 330 feet higher, submerging hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of coastal territory across the planet. Researchers have calculated more than a hundred cycles of glacier advance and retreat over the last nine million years, and at least a dozen of these have occurred in the last million with the range of these frenetic fluctuations in sea level reaching 180 meters or 590 feet. These cycles may differ slightly from one another, but the events occur with obvious periodicity and are associated with the so-called Milankovitch cycles, named after the Serbian astronomer and geophysicist Militin Milankovic, who discovered them around a century ago. He discovered that well-known changes in the parameters of the Earth's motion around the Sun, including the tilt of the Earth's axis, the eccentricity, 
of its elliptical orbit and a slight oscillation of its own axis of rotation cause periodic changes in climate at intervals of 20,000 to 100,000 years. These changes affect the flow of solar energy reaching the Earth. What's in store for our planet over the next 50,000 years? There's no doubt that sea levels will continue to fluctuate wildly, with periods of falling and rising sea levels. It is likely that over the next 20,000 years, peak ice caps will increase, glaciers will continue to grow, and sea levels will fall by at least 60 meters or 200 feet. This level has been observed at least eight times in the last million years. This will have a powerful effect on the edges of continental coasts. The U.S. East Coast will extend several kilometers to the east as the shallow continental slope becomes exposed. All major East Coast ports, from Boston to Miami, will become dry inland plateaus Alaska will be linked to Russia by a new ice-covered isthmus, and the British Isles could once again become part of continental Europe. The abundant fisheries along the continental shelves will become an integral part of the land. As for sea levels, even if they fall, they will rise again several thousand years later. Seen from the sky, in a million years' time, the Earth won't change that much. Sure, the continents will move, but no more than 45 to 60 kilometers or 30 miles from their current locations. The sun will continue to shine, rising every 24 hours, and the moon will orbit the Earth in about a month. But some things will change quite fundamentally. In many parts of the world, Irreversible geological processes are transforming the landscape. The vulnerable contours of ocean coasts will change particularly markedly. An active submarine volcano off the southeast coast of the largest of the Hawaiian Islands has already risen above 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet from the ocean floor and is growing every year. In a million years, a new island will rise from the ocean waves, already named Lohi. At the same time, the extinct volcanic islands to the northwest, including Maui, Oahu, and Kauai, will shrink under the influence of wind and ocean waves respectively. With regard to waves, those studying rocks for future changes conclude that the most active factor in changing the Earth's geography will be the advance and retreat of the ocean. A change in the rate of rift volcanism will take a very, very long time to affect this geography, depending on the amount of lava more or less solidified on the ocean floor. Sea level can fall significantly during lulls in volcanic activity when the rocks at the bottom cool and settle. Scientists believe this is what caused the sharp drop in sea level just before the Mesozoic extinction. The presence or absence of large inland seas such as the Mediterranean, as well as the reunion and breakup of continents, led to major changes in the size of coastal shelf areas. To imagine the world a few hundred million years from now, we need to look to the past for clues to understanding the future. Global tectonic processes will continue to play an important role in changing the face of the planet. Today, continents are separated from one another. Vast oceans separate America, Eurasia, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica. But these immense expanses of land are in constant motion, and their speed is around 2 to 5 centimeters, or 2 inches per year, i.e., around 1,500 kilometers, 
or 930 miles in 60 million years. We can establish fairly precise vectors of this movement for each continent by studying the age of the basalts on the ocean floor. Basalt near mid-ocean ridges is quite young, no more than a few million years old. By contrast, the age of basalt near continental margins and subduction zones can reach over 200 million years. It's easy to take into account all these age data on the composition of the ocean floor to rewind the tape of global tectonics over time and to get an idea of the geographical mobility of the terrestrial continents over the last 200 million years. Based on this information, it is also possible to project the movement of continental plates 100 million years in advance. Given the current trajectories of this movement across the planet, it appears that all continents are heading for the next collision. In a quarter of a billion years, most of the Earth's landmass will once again become a giant supercontinent. Nevertheless, the exact structure of the future supercontinent remains the subject of scientific controversy. It is possible to take into account the current movements of the continents and predict their trajectory over the next 10 to 20 million years. The Atlantic Ocean will expand by several hundred kilometers or miles, while the Pacific Ocean will shrink by around the same distance. Australia will move north towards South Asia, and Antarctica will move slightly away from the South Pole towards South Asia. Africa will move slowly northwards across the Mediterranean Sea. In a few tens of millions of years, Africa will collide with Southern Europe, closing the Mediterranean Sea and erecting a Himalayan-sized mountain range at the site of the collision. So the map of the world in 20 million years' time will look a little familiar. When modeling a map of the world 100 million years from now, most researchers identify common geographic features. For example, agreeing that the Atlantic Ocean will exceed the size of the Pacific Ocean and become the largest water basin on Earth. According to the extraversion theory, the Atlantic Ocean will continue to open up and the Americas will eventually collide with Asia, Australia, and Antarctica. In the final stages of this supercontinent assembly, North America will close the Pacific Ocean to the east and collide with Japan, and South America will wind clockwise from the southeast, joining the equatorial part of Antarctica. All these parts are astonishingly combined with each other. Thus, the new supercontinent will be a single continent, stretching from east to west along the equator. The extraversion model mainly maintains that the large convection cells in the mantle located beneath the tectonic plates will remain unchanged in their current form. In contrast, the alternative approach, known as introversion, takes the opposite stance, referring to past cycles of closure and opening of the Atlantic Ocean. Today, both supercontinent theories, extraversion and introversion, remain popular. Whatever the outcome of this discussion, everyone agrees that while in 250 million years the Earth's geography will change significantly, it will still reflect the past. According to some simulations, in around 200 million years' time, average temperatures on Earth should fall slightly below 12 degrees Celsius or 53 degrees Fahrenheit. At the same time, global sea levels will fall by around 200 meters or 650 feet. In this configuration, conditions for the development of complex life will remain quite favorable at low and mid-latitudes.
Only after around 400 million years will average surface temperatures fall to around 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and ocean levels drop by more than 500 meters or 1,640 feet from their current position. In this situation, all continents from north to south, even at moderate latitudes, will be covered by glaciers and mountainous regions at equatorial latitudes will also be frozen. However, this cold snap will not be permanent. After a further 200 to 300 million years or so, an equilibrium should be established between the decrease in temperature due to the bacterial elimination of nitrogen from the atmosphere and the increase in the sun's luminosity. The temporary assembly of continents around the equator will mitigate the impact of ice ages and moderate changes in sea level. Where continents collide, mountain ranges will rise, climate and vegetation will change, and oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere will fluctuate. These changes will be repeated throughout Earth's history. A gamma-ray burst, or huge supernova, occurs less than 6,500 light-years from Earth, within 500 to 600 million years. Gamma-ray bursts are enigmatic phenomena that appear to be the most intense and energetic explosions in the universe, and astronomers assume that they are linked to extremely powerful supernovae. Fortunately, we have yet to observe a gamma-ray burst close enough to us to fully understand what is happening. So far, gamma-ray bursts have only been detected in other galaxies. But, if such an event were to occur close to home on a cosmological scale, as it will in around 500 million years' time, less than 6,500 light-years from Earth, it could lead to a mass extinction. A gamma-ray burst directed in our direction, lasting just 10 seconds, could destroy at least half of the Earth's ozone layer. Large-scale ozone depletion could have devastating consequences on food chains, leading to the death of many species. A gamma-ray burst would annihilate life forms on the Earth's surface and in the upper layers of the ocean which currently supply significant quantities of oxygen to our atmosphere. It turns out that gamma rays also decompose the oxygen and nitrogen present in the atmosphere. These gases would be transformed into nitrogen dioxide, better known as smog. This would envelop the sun over heavily polluted areas. If this smog were to cover the entire Earth, it would block out sunlight and trigger a global ice age. Due to tidal forces, the moon has moved more than 20,000 kilometers or 12,000 miles away from the Earth. Even in the most favorable cases, the lunar disk can no longer completely cover that of the sun. In 600 million years time, all eclipses will be annular. The fate of the Earth is intimately linked to that of the Sun, which, like other stars, cannot shine forever. Fifty million years after the Sun's formation, our star became a main sequence star. Since then, its luminosity has increased in an almost linear fashion rising by around 1% every 110 million years. Within 600 million years, our Sun will undergo a gradual transformation, resulting in a progressive increase in both brightness and heat. This increase in the Sun's luminosity will have a significant impact on our planet, resulting in more solar radiation reaching the Earth. This increase will have an impact on the silicate minerals present on the planet, 
leading to increased weathering of these minerals. This, in turn, will affect the carbonate silicate cycle, which is a geochemical process involving the interaction between carbonate and silicate. Increased weathering of surface rocks traps carbon dioxide in the soil in the form of carbonate. As water evaporates from the Earth's surface, rocks harden, leading to a slowdown in plate tectonics, which eventually comes to a halt when the oceans completely evaporate. With less volcanism to recycle carbon into the Earth's atmosphere, carbon dioxide levels begin to fall. For hundreds of millions of years now, the Earth has been experiencing a period of intense cold, with an average surface temperature of around 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But now, the sun's increasing brightness is triggering a rise in the Earth's temperature, generating a series of problems. The first signs of trouble will appear within 600 million years, but it's only when the average temperature reaches 47 degrees Celsius or 117 degrees Fahrenheit when solar luminosity is 10% higher than at present in 1.1 billion years' time that the situation will become critical. From that point onwards, the Earth will begin to lose water progressively, resulting in a modification of its atmosphere and becoming a humid greenhouse due to the massive evaporation of surface water. At this point, the amount of water in the stratosphere should increase. These water molecules will be broken down by the sun's ultraviolet radiation via the process of photodisassociation. As a result, hydrogen will escape from the atmosphere. The main result should be the disappearance of the oceans in around 1.1 billion years. This water vapor, raised in the stratosphere, will undergo chemical decomposition, separating into oxygen and hydrogen. This is when major changes will take place. Higher temperatures will cause the oceans to absorb more carbon dioxide, a gas essential to plant life. This absorption will reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, causing an imbalance in the plant life cycle. It is estimated that the planet will be able to support highly organized life for another 600 million years from now, as current forecasts indicate that after this period, the sun's increasing brightness will have a significant impact on the biosphere. The emerging scenario is therefore worrying, as not only will the Earth progressively lose its precious water, but also gas is vital for plant development. Together, these elements threaten the delicate balance of our ecosystem. The high temperatures projected for the future would cause the oceans to absorb more carbon dioxide, which would disrupt the biological processes essential to plant life, accelerating the problems associated with water loss and the degradation of our atmosphere. We will be approaching the Earth's carbon dioxide compensation limit, a critical point at which the balance between carbon dioxide and oxygen becomes unsustainable for photosynthesis. In around 600 million years' time, carbon dioxide levels will be lower than those needed to maintain the C3 carbon fixation by photosynthesis used by trees. Some plants using C4 carbon fixation can survive carbon dioxide concentrations as low as 10 ppm. Currently, 99% of plants use C3 photosynthesis. Their ability to convert sunlight into energy is gradually declining, leading to a general decline in plant biomass. If atmospheric CO2 levels fall, the survival 
of embryophytic plants becomes difficult as they require a minimum concentration of around 10 ppm atmospheric CO2. It is highly probable that the evolution of living organisms will enable a certain number of organisms to adapt to these conditions by using a more efficient photosynthetic carbon acquisition mechanism. When levels fall below this value, complex plants begin to die, leading to a reduction in oxygen production. This decrease, combined with continued consumption by biota and oxidation of kerogen, which is organic carbon in sedimentary rocks, leads to a gradual decline in the atmospheric oxygen until it reaches zero within a few million years. Researchers estimate that plants that use the C3 photosynthesis process to fix atmospheric carbon dioxide should disappear in 600 million years and C4 plants in 840 million years at the latest due to the loss of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This massive disappearance of plants would have devastating consequences for all living beings as we know them today. Plants are at the very base of the food chain, providing food and energy for herbivores. Their decline means fewer food resources for herbivores, which in turn suffer adverse consequences. Their populations begin to decline, upsetting the balance of ecosystems. Without plants to produce oxygen through photosynthesis, animals would face a disastrous situation. Large endothermic animals, such as mammals and birds, would probably be the first to disappear, due to their higher oxygen requirements, compared to smaller, endothermic and ectothermic animals. As atmospheric oxygen levels fall and temperatures rise, placental mammals will become particularly vulnerable. Not only do they have higher oxygen requirements than non-placental mammals, but embryonic development is also highly sensitive to excessive heat. Large herbivorous mammals would suffer from diminishing food resources as plant availability declines. Small mammals would be slightly less affected due to their lower oxygen requirements and surface-to-volume ratio, which facilitates heat dissipation. Placental mammals experience higher body temperatures than marsupials and monotremes, making them potentially more sensitive to rising temperatures. Birds may be better adapted to survival than larger mammals, as their generally smaller size means they need less oxygen. What's more, migratory birds in particular would be better equipped than animals of a similar size, thanks to their ability to travel long distances in search of cooler refuges. Nevertheless, the number of such refuges would decrease as temperatures continue to rise, these refuges would also be likely to be found at higher altitudes, where less land surface would be available, limiting population size as species migrate to higher altitudes. Ectothermic vertebrates such as fish, amphibians, and reptiles could survive longer than endothermic animals in this scenario, thanks to their better heat tolerance and generally lower oxygen requirements. However, reduced water availability would make some amphibian species more vulnerable in such an environment. Fish species would also be at risk, although rapid evaporation from the oceans would not occur at this stage. Marine species may have a better survival capacity than freshwater species due to the greater volume of ocean water compared with freshwater. For ectotherms, ambient temperature influences their metabolic rate. An increase in ambient temperature 
would lead to an increase in metabolic rate, and therefore a greater need for food. As a result, surviving species could be exposed to starvation. Reptile species whose sex determination depends on temperatures would be more sensitive to rising temperatures. Invertebrates could be the last animals on Earth before all animal species disappear. Some insects, such as beetles, can survive temperatures of up to 56 degrees Celsius or 133 degrees Fahrenheit. In general, terrestrial life would initially be more vulnerable than marine life due to the regulating effects of water temperature. However, the loss of terrestrial vegetation would lead to a reduction in nutrients reaching the oceans. Isolated communities in marine ecosystems, such as animal populations living near volcanic vents, would probably survive longer. Depending on the half-life of oxygen in the atmosphere, animal life could persist for up to 100 million years after the disappearance of plants. Some cyanobacteria and phytoplankton could survive without plants as they are able to tolerate carbon dioxide levels as low as one part per million. They could persist until the atmosphere becomes too depleted of carbon dioxide to allow any form of photosynthesis. In one study, researchers claim that a specific form of animal life could persist even after most plant life on Earth had disappeared. They used fossil evidence from the Burgess Shale in British Columbia, Canada to study the climate of the Cambrian explosion and used it to predict the future climate when global temperatures would rise due to a warming sun and decreasing oxygen levels leading to the ultimate extinction of animal life. Initially, they expected some insects, lizards, birds and small mammals to persist, as well as marine life. However, without a continuous supply of oxygen from plant life, they estimated that animals would probably die of asphyxiation. Even if enough oxygen were to remain in the atmosphere, thanks to the persistence of some form of photosynthesis, steadily rising global temperatures would lead to a progressive loss of biodiversity. As temperatures continue to rise, the last animals will be forced to move to the polar regions or even underground. They would mainly be active during polar night periods and would go into astivation during polar day periods due to the intense heat. Much of the Earth's surface would become an arid desert and life would concentrate mainly in the oceans. However, due to a decrease in the input of organic matter from the land and a reduction in dissolved oxygen, marine life would also disappear, following a similar pattern to that of the land surface. This process would begin with the loss of freshwater species and end with the invertebrates, particularly those not dependent on living plants, such as termites, or those found near hydrothermal springs, such as worms of the Riftia genus. Without CO2, photosynthesis can no longer take place. Without plant life to recycle oxygen back into the atmosphere, free oxygen and the ozone layer will disappear from the atmosphere, allowing intense levels of deadly UV light to reach the surface. As a result of these processes, multicellular life forms could become extinct in around 800 million years and eukaryotes in 1.3 billion years, leaving only prokaryotes. To meet the sun's energy needs, the nuclear fusion reactions taking place at its core convert around 500 tons of hydrogen into helium every second. 
The main effect of this alchemy is a progressive reduction in the number of particles energy the sun releases. This is why the sun's luminosity increases with the passage of time. Thanks to an effective greenhouse effect, the Earth has maintained a stable temperature, apart from a few periods of glaciation, which have enabled life to evolve on its surface. For hundreds of millions of years, the Earth has not undergone any significant change in its ocean mass, thanks to the near equilibrium of mantle water inflows and outflows. To maintain water in a liquid state on our planet, it is essential to establish a balance between the solar energy absorbed and that emitted, enabling us to maintain adequate temperatures. This balance is crucial to the survival of life as we know it. When the amount of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere increases, as is currently the case, a new energy balance is created, where the greenhouse effect creates an additional blanket causing the surface to warm up. The Earth has an integrated regulating mechanism called the carbonate silicate cycle, which controls the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to maintain a stable climate. Unfortunately, this cycle operates on a time scale of the order of a million years, making it too slow to be an effective solution for the current global warming problem we humans face. Progressively, even during the current calm period of hydrogen combustion, the sun is inexorably rising in temperature. Some 4.5 billion years ago, at the very beginning, its luminosity was equivalent to 70% of today's level. By the time of the Great Oxygen event some 2.4 billion years ago, its brightness had already reached 85% of today's level. For the next billion years, the Sun will continue to produce nuclear energy by converting hydrogen into helium. This is what almost all stars do most of the time. As the Sun converts hydrogen to helium in its core, the average molecular weight increases, leading to a rise in core temperature and the speed of the fusion reaction, known as the proton-proton chain. This gradually leads to an increase in the star's energy release. As a result, the Sun will shine even brighter. When the amount of incoming energy increases, it can also contribute to global warming. This is precisely what happens when the sun's brightness gradually increases. Although the Earth's climate may experience shorter-term variations due to the seasons, changes in atmospheric composition, such as the addition of man-made greenhouse gases, as well as factors such as volcanic dust, and Milankovitch cycles, the Earth's surface is experiencing a slow but steady warming due to increasing solar luminosity. Over a period of time, perhaps even several hundred million years, the Earth's feedback may attenuate this effect. The greater the thermal energy, the more intense the evaporation, hence the increase in cloud cover which contributes to the reflection of most sunlight back into space. Increased thermal energy means faster weathering of rocks, greater absorption of carbon dioxide, and lower levels of greenhouse gases. Thus, negative feedbacks will preserve life-supporting conditions on Earth long enough. At some point, the Earth's atmosphere will reach a threshold where it will no longer be able to maintain a stable energy balance, leading to an amplification of the greenhouse effect. This phenomenon is often likened to a runaway greenhouse, characterized by positive feedback. As the planet's surface warms up, water evaporation from the atmosphere increases. 
Water is a powerful greenhouse gas, which reinforces the greenhouse effect and further warms the planet's surface. For several million years, cellular life can persist in such conditions. However, the critical moment will inevitably arrive when the greenhouse effect becomes uncontrollable, warming the Earth's surface to the point where the oceans reach a state of complete evaporation. Despite the increased amount of water vapor near the Earth's surface, there will be no liquid ocean left. After that, it will only take a few hundred million years for the oceans to evaporate, transforming the atmosphere into an endless pool of steam. When ultraviolet light interacts with atmospheric gas, it can cause the gas to heat up further, meaning that more heat is transferred to atmospheric water when it interacts with extreme ultraviolet light. As a result, the water absorbs more energy and heats up faster. This leads to an increase in water evaporation and consequently, a more rapid loss of water from the Earth's surface. Another way of explaining this is to use the concept of the habitable zone, which refers to the orbital region around a star where a planet can maintain liquid water, provided it has a suitable atmosphere. At present, the inner edge of the Sun's habitable zone is around 95% of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Our planet will then be completely devoid of life, but the real apocalypse will come later. As the Sun's luminosity increases, the inner edge of the habitable zone will move progressively further out. It's hard to say exactly when the inner edge of the habitable zone will reach the Earth's orbit, but it's estimated to be around a billion years. Some extremophiles may still live in refuges at higher latitudes or deep underground, but these will only be ephemeral remnants of a once exuberant biosphere a situation that could recall the attractive symmetry of life's beginnings on Earth. In all likelihood, Earth will follow the fate of Venus, becoming a hot, barren world. As the habitable zone of our Sun has shifted towards the outer solar system, Mars is now located in this zone. It is possible that Mars's surface temperature will gradually rise, Carbon dioxide and water currently frozen beneath the Martian soil will be released into the atmosphere, creating a greenhouse effect. This will warm the planet until it reaches conditions comparable to those on Earth today, potentially offering a new island for life. According to computer models, the Moon's presence seems to stabilize the Earth's obliquity, helping to avoid dramatic climate changes. This stability is due to the fact that the Moon accelerates the precessional motion of the Earth's rotational axis, preventing resonances between the precession of the rotation and the precession of the planet's orbital plane. The tidal acceleration caused by the Moon slows the Earth's rotation and increases the distance between the Earth and the Moon. As the semi-major axis of the Moon's orbit continues to increase, this stabilizing effect will diminish. At some point, the disturbances will probably lead to chaotic variations in the Earth's obliquity, and the tilt axis could tilt to angles as high as 90 degrees to the plane of the orbit. This is estimated to happen between 1.5 and 4.5 billion years ago. High obliquity would probably lead to dramatic climate changes and could compromise the planet's habitability. When the Earth's axial tilt exceeds 
54 degrees, annual insulation at the equator becomes lower than at the poles. It is possible for the planet to maintain an obliquity of 60 degrees to 90 degrees for periods as long as 10 million years. The likely consequence is that ocean evaporation, plate tectonics, and the entire carbon cycle will come to an end. This could happen in around 2 to 3 billion years time when the planet's magnetic dynamo could cease to function, leading to the decomposition of the magnetosphere. This would lead to an accelerated loss of volatile elements from the outer atmosphere. In 2.8 billion years, the Earth's surface temperature, even at the poles, averages 147 degrees Celsius, or 297 degrees Fahrenheit. Life is reduced to single-cell colonies in isolated and scattered microenvironments, such as underground caves, and dies out everywhere else. Every second, the sun emits a solar wind in the direction of our planet, corresponding to a flow of a million tons of protons and electrons these particles are stopped in their tracks by the Van Allen belts, the Earth's magnetic field. Stretching over 70,000 kilometers or 43,000 miles, it originates from the Earth's iron-nickel core. The core is composed of a solid part, the seed, and a liquid layer 2,000 kilometers or 1,240 miles thick. The uninterrupted stirring of the liquid metal layer leads to the formation of the magnetic field. At present, the radius of the inner core is increasing at an average rate of around 0.5 millimeters per year at the expense of the outer core. Virtually all the energy required to power the dynamo is supplied by the inner core. Within three billion years, the inner core is expected to absorb most, if not all, of the outer core, resulting in an almost entirely solidified core composed mainly of iron and other heavy elements. The remaining liquid envelope will consist mainly of lighter elements that will undergo less mixing. Tectonic plate dynamics are generated by the transfer of heat from the Earth's core to the surface. This heat transfer takes place through the mantle by convection, sometimes combined with thermal conduction. When heat plumes reach the crust, they reach their heat and are pushed out by new hot plumes. This horizontal movement in the upper mantle is the driving force behind the movement of tectonic plates. However, as the Earth cools over time, the liquid outer core gradually solidifies. This solidification reduces convection in the mantle, limiting the power available to move the plates. Eventually, after around 3 billion years, convection will cease completely, putting an end to tectonic plate movements. If plate tectonics cease at some point, the Earth's interior will cool less efficiently, slowing or even halting the growth of the inner core. In both cases, this could lead to the loss of the magnetic dynamo. Without a functional dynamo, the Earth's magnetic field will weaken rapidly over a geologically short period of around 10,000 years the disappearance of the magnetosphere will lead to increased erosion of light elements, notably hydrogen, from the Earth's atmosphere into space, creating conditions less conducive to life. In around 4 billion years, the increase in temperature at the Earth's surface will trigger an uncontrollable greenhouse effect, 
creating conditions even more extreme than those on Venus today. This will heat up the atmosphere and raise the surface temperature above 500 degrees Celsius or 932 degrees Fahrenheit, high enough to melt the planet's surface in some places. Nevertheless, much of the atmosphere will be retained until the sun enters its red giant phase. At that point, the Earth's biosignatures will disappear to be replaced by signatures caused by non-biological processes. From then on, all traces of Earth's life history will be completely erased. In 4.5 billion years, interactions between the Andromeda Galaxy, M31, and the Milky Way will form a new galaxy called Milcomeda. The Andromeda Galaxy, also known as M31, is a spiral galaxy containing up to 1,000 billion stars, compared with 300 to 400 billion for the Milky Way. Made up of gas and dust, it adopts a flattened disk shape and contains a bulge at its center. Originally located 2.55 million light years away, the Andromeda Galaxy has always been the closest to the Milky Way. It has been gradually closing in on the Milky Way at a speed of 120 kilometers per second, or 75 miles per hour. At first, the two galaxies don't seem to have collided. Being so far apart, the stars will initially pass each other without colliding head-on, before moving apart. Sometime later, this apparent choreography leads to a new rapprochement, this time followed by a strong interaction between the two galaxies. Their orbits are strongly affected by the anarchy of gravitational forces in place during the galaxy's interpenetration. The result, after two billion years, is the birth of a gigantic system with little interstellar gas, a new galaxy, Milcomeda. Unlike its two parents, this new galaxy is elliptical in shape, and the stars it contains are scattered around a sphere. The Milky Way and M31 no longer exist. This collision will not disrupt the orbits of planets within the solar system. While the gravity of passing stars can detach planets in interstellar space, the distances between stars are so great that the probability of the Milky Way Andromeda collision causing disruption to a given star system is negligible. Although the solar system as a whole could be affected by these events, the Sun and planets are unlikely to be disturbed. The new galaxy sees a new outburst of stars, but as the little remaining gas is rapidly consumed, star formation comes to a halt, and the new galaxy will slowly fade away as its new stars die out. In five billion years time, the Sun will leave its main sequence and begin its transformation into a red giant, having exhausted the hydrogen reserves in its core. The energy released during the fusion of hydrogen nuclei in the Sun's core fuels the frenetic agitation of lively particles that exert a powerful outward pressure. It is thanks to this pressure that the Sun swells and does not collapse under its own weight. Until now, this balance has been maintained, but now, at 5 billion years, this is no longer the case. Although the Sun still abounds in hydrogen nuclei, there are virtually none left in its core. Hydrogen fusion produces helium, whose nuclei are heavier and denser than those of hydrogen. It is in the core of the Sun 
that the temperature is highest at around 15 million degrees Celsius or 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. The fusion of hydrogen into helium requires 10 million degrees Celsius or 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. On the other hand, helium fusion requires a temperature of the order of 100 million degrees Celsius or 180 million degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is nowhere near this threshold, so as helium replaces hydrogen in the core, the fuel supply for fusion will diminish. Pressure from energy production will decline, and gravity will prevail, causing the sun to implode. As its gigantic mass collapses in on itself, the sun's temperature will rise dramatically. Despite this pressure and extreme temperature, helium fusion is still not possible, and the hydrogen then triggers a second phase of fusion within a thin layer around the helium core. As hydrogen fusion proceeds at an inordinate rate, the thrust is much more intense than before. The sun swells to colossal proportions, reaching over 100 million kilometers, or 62 million miles, in diameter, almost a hundred times its current diameter. Transforming into a pulsating red giant, it will become thousands of times brighter than it is today. It leaves its main sequence to become a red giant. Naturally, the planets in the solar system will be directly affected by this change. The Sun, with its diminished mass, exerts less gravitational attraction, enabling the planets to migrate to more distant orbits. But do the planets go far enough to win the race against the Sun's increasing diameter? Mercury loses the race, swallowed by the Sun and briefly vaporized, Mars, orbiting further out, escapes unscathed. Venus is lucky. The Sun stops swelling just before it reaches its new orbit. And at the same time, the Earth is also spared. Nevertheless, conditions are fundamentally different. Earth and Mars rotate synchronously with the Sun. The average temperature is now several thousand degrees. What does a sunrise look like from Earth today? Instead of a warm, cheerful yellow disk, a gigantic red circle slowly settles above the horizon. It won't be long before Mars suffers the same fate as Earth. The atmosphere begins to warm. Potential life forms on this planet won't survive another one billion years. Two new orbits are now taking their place in our solar system's habitable zone, the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. Although neither planet is conducive to life, either Jupiter with water in its clouds or Saturn made up entirely of gas, their respective moons could become suitable places for the appearance of primitive life once their temperatures have risen. In this way, simple organisms could see life on the surface of Saturn's moons, Enceladus or Titan, or Jupiter's moon Europa. Most of the Earth's atmosphere will gradually be lost to space. The Earth's surface will be transformed into an ocean of lava, with floating continents of metals and metal oxides and icebergs of refractory materials. Surface temperatures will rise dramatically, exceeding 2,000 degrees Celsius or 3,632 degrees Fahrenheit. Then over 12 billion years old, the Sun's most rapid expansion phase as a red giant will occur in its final stages in 7.4 billion years' time. At this stage, it is likely to expand sufficiently to reach a maximum radius of around 1.2 astronomical units. The Sun, 
will have lost more than a third of its current mass, which will have dispersed in the form of an intense solar wind. This loss of mass will cause the orbits of each planet to expand considerably. Considering only this phenomenon, Venus and Earth could probably escape incineration, but other studies suggest that the two planets would still be absorbed due to tidal interactions with the tenuous gas of the Sun's expanded outer envelope. Forecasts for the end of our planet are therefore rather gloomy. The Earth's gravitational interaction with the Sun's outer atmosphere will cause the Earth's orbit to shrink. The drag effect of the Sun's chromosphere will progressively reduce the Earth's orbit. These effects will partly compensate for the Sun's loss of mass, making it likely that the Sun will eventually engulf the Earth in around 7.59 billion years. The Sun's atmospheric drag can also cause the Moon's orbit to disintegrate. As the Moon's orbit approaches a distance of 18,470 kilometers, or 11,477 miles, it will cross the Earth's Roche limit, meaning that tidal forces exerted by the Earth will break the Moon apart, transforming it into a system of rings. Most of these orbital rings will begin to decay, and the residual debris will impact the Earth. As a result, even if the Sun doesn't directly engulf the Earth, it's possible that the planet will be left without a moon. But the Earth's decaying trajectory towards the Sun may eliminate the Earth's mantle, leaving only its core. Eventually, the Earth's core would also be destroyed 200 years later. According to this gloomy scenario, the Sun's red giant will simply destroy the Earth, which will evaporate into the hot solar atmosphere and cease to exist. But the story of the Sun as a red giant doesn't end there. As the hydrogen nuclei continue to fuse around the core, more helium will flow into the center, and the temperature will rise even higher. The cycle is fueled. Hydrogen fusion in the shell around the core accelerates, and the helium deluge at the center intensifies. This phase will last 500 million years before the core finally reaches the temperature required for helium fusion a process that produces carbon and oxygen. This transition from hydrogen to helium fusion is marked by a spectacular eruption, during which the sun contracts to a more constant subgiant structure. This new equilibrium was short-lived. 100 million years later, in the same way that helium had displaced hydrogen, Carbon and oxygen nuclei drove helium out of the core and into neighboring layers. The combustion of oxygen and carbon now requires higher temperatures, at least 600 million degrees Celsius. This time, the core will never reach the temperature required to restart nuclear reactions. Its mass is not high enough to reach the temperatures required to fuse carbon and hydrogen nuclei into heavier, more complex elements. The helium shell continues to burn, and the core continues to contract until Pauli's exclusion principle stops the implosion. This quantum mechanism acts as a repulsion. It's as if the electrons refuse to be compressed any further bringing the Sun's contraction to an end. The outer layers continue to expand and cool, before being scattered across the cosmos. All that remains is a staggeringly dense ball of carbon and oxygen, known as a white dwarf. It will continue to glow for another few billion years. Fusion reactions will cease, 
and the temperature is no longer high enough. The sun's thermal energy will be gently dissipated into space, leaving a dark, cold globe. In 9 billion years, the sun, with a mass equal to 54% of its current mass, will become a white dwarf, composed of carbon and oxygen. Our sun is now dead, and its core laid bare. Its power of attraction on orbiting bodies such as planets, comets, and asteroids will have weakened due to its loss of mass in the previous stages. All the orbits of the remaining planets will expand. If the Earth is still around, its orbit is now twice as far away as the orbit we know today. All the planets will become dark, icy, and completely devoid of any form of life. They will continue to orbit their star, their speed reduced by the increased distance from the Sun and its reduced gravity. More than 4 billion years later, the white dwarf Sun has cooled to a temperature of 2,000 degrees Celsius or 3,632 degrees Fahrenheit. Its luminosity falls below that of the Sun. Its luminosity falls below three billionths of its current level. Its heat is no longer measurable. It is now invisible to the human eye. So weak is its radiation that it is drowned in that of the cosmic microwave background. The Sun is gradually changing from a white dwarf to a black dwarf. The prospects for the destruction of our planet are not merely speculative, but based on solid predictions based on our scientific advances. Although we have knowledge of the Earth's distant future, it is up to us to shape the short-term future. This perspective raises fundamental questions about the future of life on Earth, and our responsibility as a species to be aware of this potential future. It is crucial that we deepen our scientific knowledge, develop environmental preservation strategies, and explore innovative solutions to prepare our planet's biodiversity and sustainability. While this may seem a long way off on a human scale, it remains an inescapable reality in the natural evolution of our solar system. Understanding these phenomena and their implications enables us to better appreciate the importance of preserving our environment and exploring new avenues to ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. This is the ultimate dream of a scientifically literate society and our only hope of staving off, as far as possible, the imminent threat of human extinction.